Okay. <clears throat> so for our, our final uh, discussion today, we're going to be discussing the role of the EPA in uh, U.S. energy and climate policy. And I think in the interest of everybody being able to, to see everybody else's presentation, what we'll do is we'll just sort of go, go in order, and at the end of the last presentation, we'll have all the speakers come up so we can entertain questions from the audience if that works. So uh, we'll go in order of the, of the agenda here. So first up is uh, Bill Bumpers. He's a partner with Baker Botts in D.C., where he heads uh, their global climate practice. Uh, he focuses on climate change and Clean Air Act issues, particularly as they affect the energy industry. Uh, I'm not going to. <laughs> he advises a wide range of clients, and uh, with that, I will turn the floor to you. I was afraid he was going to read that whole long, boring bio. Read it at your leisure, uh, or not. Uh, first, let me just say it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this is, uh, fortunately, it's the, the third time I've been asked to speak at a, at a Baker Institute conference. And, I tell people when you come to these, you know, strap on because this is not your average fluff conference. You better be ready to listen, learn, and, and stick with it. And uh, kudos to all of you, especially the two-dayers who are here for this, this last presentation. Uh, we've heard a lot about the bipartisanship on climate change, and, and I guess I'm here to give you a bipartisan presentation on U.S. Uh, climate and environmental policy and how it affects energy markets, uh, bipartisan in the frame of it's schizophrenic, and I'll give you both sides, because uh, there's nothing bipartisan about it. Um, let's see, which arrow do I use here? Down, there we go. Uh, here, here's what I want to try to, to push on, and, and uh, I'm going to give you my conclusions right up front, which is that as a result of, of energy and environmental policy, and I mean climate and environmental policy from EPA, we're going to see some significant changes in the power sector in the next 10 years and a pretty dramatic shift, um, unless there's legislation, a pretty dramatic shift uh, from coal towards natural gas. Uh, natural gas uh, demand and supply are both going to increase pretty significantly, and, and Ken has given you the information as to how that will happen, the supply at least, and I'm going to provide some of the demand driver experience. Uh, and then I'm not going to touch on this much. I'm not really a, uh, as much of a mobile source expert, but, but I think there's a fair argument to be made that in the U.S., uh, we've, we've seen peak demand rather than peak supply on gasoline and, and oil consumption. And I can say that I think the, the U.S. climate policy, in part because, as Joe said earlier, the prospects of, of significant climate legislation in the next few years is, approaches zero, although I'm going to give you an alternative scenario where that could change. But, but because there's unlikely to be comprehensive legislation, EPA policy on climate is going to have very little effect on energy markets, in my opinion. So let me just give you a very quick overview on, on the state of play. Uh, existing climate law and policy, we have a renewable fuel standard for gasoline that's supposed to take us to 20% by 2023. We now have CAFE standards, and EPA has finalized their, their mobile source, which is really nothing more than a CAFE standard in a regulatory format that's supposed to take us to 37 miles per gallon by 2020. That combination is pretty profound in terms of the impact on uh, actual petro-gasoline uh, petro uh, from hydrocarbons. Uh, legislation, just a quick summary, you know, climate legislation is dead. And it's going to be dead for at least two years, again, with one exception that I'm going to play out in a minute. And we now have uh, what masquerades as climate policy, which is the Bingham and Brownback proposal to establish a 15% renewable energy standard or electricity standard by 2020. This is not even going to keep up with the state initiatives, uh, but it does do one thing, which it will create a national market for RECs, which has been sorely missing. The REC market is fragmented, disaggregated, and dysfunctional today because there are 27 states with various REC programs and virtually none of them allow trading of these uh, renewable energy credits between and among those states. So even though this 15 percent standard, if it passes, and there's a chance that it will, won't push new development, it will at least establish a more stable market for the RECs, which will help to stimulate development down the road. It'll also, I think, incrementally make it a lot easier to up that standard 
uh, in the coming years if they want to go there. So that leads us to the state of play and regulation and what is EPA doing. Uh, this is the list. They've got a mandatory record keeping and reporting rule that goes into effect uh, January 1 of next year in which uh, sources with emissions over 25,000 tons a year are going to have to record and report their emissions. There's no reduction obligations, just record and report. The mobile source rule, the 208 rules, which is again is the CAFE standard that's a little bit more stringent than the 35 miles per gallon standard. Uh, major sources of emissions uh, defined uh, down below is the tailoring rule with 100,000 tons are going to have to go in and get major Title V operating permits. Uh, you know, it's just to be honest, a, a, a nuisance to the states because there's no law that requires them to control their greenhouse gas emissions, but because they have greenhouse gas emissions, they have to get a permit. Well, the, what's that permit going to say? I, I have greenhouse gas emissions. It's almost nonsensical. But it provides a mechanism, along with the new source review rule for, for, for stationary sources, for the environmental community to sue the pants off of all the major sources. And that's probably the principal effect that these two rules are going to have on climate change. Uh, the new source review rule, by the way, is if you are a new source with over 100,000 tons or you're an existing source, think of a power plant, so a 800 megawatt power plant will emit six, six and a half million tons a year, you have to get a new source permit, and that means installing best available control technology. We have no idea what that is. Uh, it's not carbon capture and storage at this point. It might be fuel switching, or you might have to consider natural gas instead of coal. That's a very hotly debated issue that's going to play itself out over the coming months. Uh, and then this tailoring rule, which was EPA's attempt to address the problems of both Title V and, and New Source Review, they changed the major source threshold. Uh, under the statute, the major source threshold is 250 tons, which is not much. It's uh, about 45 seconds at a power plant. Um, so they, they've elevated the major source threshold to 100,000 tons, and the modification threshold, that is, if you're an existing power plant and you're going to change a component out, uh, you've got to do an analysis to say, well, does that component cause your emissions to go up by 75,000 tons? If so, that triggers back review as well. This is going to be litigated. I'd say there's a fair chance the tailoring rule gets overturned. Uh, but in any event, most of, most of industry, frankly, are going to be able to avoid backed uh, for existing sources through good aggressive management techniques. So that's not going to do anything. The one thing it's likely to do, though, again, is going to generate a huge amount of litigation. So every time a power plant, refinery, chemical company does a maintenance project worth, you know, three or four million dollars, even though they may do this every three or four months, the environmental community is going to be out there suing them that they should have gotten a new source review permit and gone through a PSD and gotten a backed, this best available control technology installed, and there's going to be just a torrent of litigation over this. But, you know, is it going to actually change anything? But here, in my, my view on that is, it's not going to do a lot. There, there is no underlying authority for EPA to say, power industry, chemical industry, refining industry, cement industry, reduce your emissions. There's nothing there. So you have to trigger this new source review process for there even to be a review as to what BACT is. And we don't know what BACT is today because it's supposed to be a commercially available technology that, that BACT is likely to be good combustion practices, maybe a little co-firing with a lower emitting fuel. But that's about it. That'll evolve over time. But for right now, it's not much. So that's the climate policy. And I don't think it's going to do a lot for our climate. Uh, on the other hand, we have a whole slew of Clean Air Act uh, regulations that are coming down the pike that are going to have a very profound impact on our greenhouse gas emissions, at least from the power industry. So if you think about it right now, EPA is in the process of revising the ozone standard, the, the national ambient air quality standards around the country. And I know Stephen's going to talk about this, so I'm going to gloss over it quickly. Uh, and there's a clean air transport rule, which is a replacement for what was known as the CARE rule, which Administrator Johnson uh, passed when he was in, at EPA. 
very, very good environmental program that got struck down by the D.C. Circuit. This replacement rule is, is aimed at reducing SO2 and NOx from the power industry. It is going to create economic incentives to put on controls and for a lot of older units and, and smaller units probably to shut down. The same for visibility in BART. Uh, it's the best available retrofit technology. Don't you love the alphabet soup of the environmental programs? Uh, all of the relatively older power plants have to demonstrate that their emissions don't affect visibility in class one areas, think national parks and wilderness areas, and if they do, then they have to reduce their emissions of SO2 and NOx. Uh, and then you've got ongoing new source review enforcement. I, I'm involved in four different lawsuits on behalf of the power industry and the refining industry where EPA is suing them, trying to get them to put on more controls and or shut down. And then finally, and this is where I'm going to spend a little time, is the new electric generating unit rule for hazardous air pollutants, or commonly known as the EGU MACT, or the MACT rule. Let me, this is going to have, this is a game changer for the power sector potentially. EPA is going to have to come up with this rule. The proposed rule is supposed to come out in March. Final rule come out in November of next year. They'll probably miss that deadline, uh, but it is in a consent decree. What that does is it requires all major sources in the power industry, and that is all sources in the power industry, because the major source threshold is 10 tons, uh, to install MACT, Maximum Achievable Control Technology. And they're going to have to do it for mercury, for hydrogen chloride, and hydrogen fluoride, and for metals, and all 188 pollutants listed as hazardous air pollutants. MACT is defined in the statute as the emission levels that are achieved by the best performing 12% of sources in the source category. It's a mouthful. But for these acid gases, and to a lesser degree for mercury, the acid gases will drive this technology. It is wet gas scrubbers on large coal-fired power plants because wet gas scrubbers can remove 99% of the acid gases. In all of the West, there are no wet gas scrubbers. They use dry scrubbers because they don't have water. It's a huge water constraint. They can get maybe 95% of the acid gases if they are putting so much sorbent and lime into it that they're filling up their bag houses on an hourly basis. But they really have to slog the lime to it. But they can't get to a wet gas scrubber technology level. This statute is incredibly unforgiving. There is no flexibility. Once EPA determines what MACT is, there is no exception in the statute. There is no exception in the regulation. So once they promulgate this regulation, all of the, all of the plants in the country are basically facing, within three to five years, the installation of scrubbers. Well, what are the implications for that? And the answer is pretty straightforward. If you are a small or old coal-fired power plant, you're going to shut down. The cost of putting a wet gas scrubber in a 400 megawatt power plant is roughly 300 to 350 million dollars. And then there are ongoing operational costs associated with that as well. So how many of these plants that are 250 megawatts or greater or smaller or plants that are 40 years older can afford that? And the answer is not many. This is, you probably can't see the detail on this. This reflects the small coal-fired power plants in the country. The little dotted line that goes up there, the, the smallest 60%, that is those units that are 250 megawatts or smaller, uh, less than 24% of those are scrubbed. That represents about 17% of all coal-fired capacity that is going to be very, very hard-pressed to justify an investment of of that kind of magnitude, very few of them. Let's look at the same graphic. This is for age by age. And if you think about what, what you really want to know is how efficient are these plants? But age is not a bad proxy because the older plants are not nearly as efficient as the newer plants. And if you look at, again, the space to the left, those plants to the left are over 40 years old. And if you've got a 40 year old coal plant, it's probably not very efficient. Plus, it's starting to cost you a lot of money in maintenance. Are you really going to spend 300 to 500 million dollars putting a scrubber on it? And the answer is a significant portion of these, 
because less than a fifth of them are already scrubbed, and those that are scrubbed probably were scrubbed in the 70s, and they're only getting maybe 70% removal. Those plants are going to probably, a fair portion, are going to disappear. Well, what are the implications of that? Let me see if I can get this to advance. Wait, went too far? No, let's see. Yeah. So, you know, where are you going to make it up? It's, it's going to be gas, at least initially. As of right now, we have a lot of gas-fired capacity in the country, uh, 397 gigawatts of capacity versus only 313 gigawatts of coal right now. EIA forecasts a significant increase in gas capacity by 2035, 116 gigawatts with uh, 31 new gigawatts of coal. I think that's a gross overstatement. Um, the difference is, is that coal-fired operators run. I mean, they're operating at 73% capacity factor, whereas gas, even the combined cycle units, which are designed to be baseload, only run at 41% capacity factor. So they're in the, particularly in the combined cycle existing capacity, there's room to take up some slack if those coal plants shut down, but it's not enough. And it also assumes that gas prices are going to remain relatively constant. Let's see here. Come on. You've got to really whack this thing to get it to move, don't you? So, you know, we're going to see, I mean, there's no question that a significant portion, I would guess 17 to 20 percent of, of, I'm going to skip this slide, of, the, of, the, uh, of that capacity, these small and older units, are going to go away. Not all of them, and I, I can't venture to tell you how much, but some significant portion. But let's say it's less, let's say it's half. Well, what does that represent? Uh, the real potential is if 10 per, to 20 percent of that generation, uh, that is the small and old ones, go away, that would increase the demand for gas by 1.3 to 2.6 trillion cubic feet a year. It's about a 7 to 8 percent increase in demand, and that will have to happen if this max rulemaking is as forcing as I think it's going to be, going to have to happen within the next seven years. I'm not sure, Ken, you could probably address this better, I'm not sure we can accommodate that. And that's going to be a real constraint then on the electric supply. Come on. Wow. So this is, just very quickly, you know, this is the historic, and you probably have seen these slides, this is historic imports, production, and consumption, and you can see the uptick from the development of the Marcellus Shale, and that's going to have to happen pretty good. And this is the projection over the next 35 years, but if you think about adding to that blue line uh, uh, starting in 20, call it 2018, 1.3 to, to, to 2 trillion cubic feet a year, you're already immediately over the 25 a trillion cubic feet per year line, and there's going to be a bigger gap on production. It goes back to, well, where do we make that up? Is it from the Marcella shale? Is it from the Barnett shale? Is it from LNG imports? I don't know. I'll leave that to the smart guys like Ken. Uh, and I, I really, on that, I'm going to get to the concluding remarks. Uh, so my, my view is our traditional greenhouse gas regulation through EPA is really not going to be very effective. It's going to create a torrent of litigation, but it's not going to do much for our greenhouse gas emissions. I think the Clean Air Act in the regulations is going to have a pretty profound impact, and it's going to create a pretty significant increase in demand for gas. Now, the one scenario where I mentioned that I see the possibility for legislation is going to be once EPA proposes the MAC rulemaking, and they turn to Congress and they say, it's your statute. We don't, you know, we've been smacked down by the D.C. Circuit four times on this rule. This is what we have to do. The courts say it. It's your rule. you got to do something about it. They're going to turn back to Congress and say, okay, let's look at an SO2, NOx, and mercury rulemaking that really makes sense. And, oh, by the way, if we're going to do that in the power industry, we kind of need to know what we're going to have to pay for carbon for the next 20 years because we're going to be spending trillions of dollars in retrofits for, this, for these plants. And I'm not going to do that unless I have better certainty on CO2 prices. And in the power industry, I think more than half of the CEOs are ready for a rational cap-and-trade program that affects them. 
we could get between the existing mobile source regulations and a cap and trade on the power industry plus the half a million ton a year uh, sources that remain, you'd get almost 80% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. anyway. And so it's possible that even with the more Republican Senate uh, and House, that when these regulations come, come out, there could be a forcing event that could lead to legislation. I would put it pretty low. Thank you. Okay, we're uh, again withholding questions till the end so we can do this in a panel format. Uh, next up is uh, the Honorable Stephen Johnson. He's the President and CEO of Stephen Johnson Associates Strategic Consulting. Um, and relevant to this discussion, he is a previous administrator of the EPA, and I think I will stop there and let him take the podium. Thanks, Ken, Amy, and it really is an honor for me to be here and join you as well. And I did have the privilege and opportunity to be here yesterday and hear all the great presentations. And as I said over dinner last night, uh, the, all of the topics yesterday and thus far today were among the topics that were uh, on the table and being debated at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I wanted to take a, a few minutes this afternoon because uh, I come to you as not only the former administrator, although someone suggested the former administrators, a better title would be recovering administrators, um, but uh, I come to you also as a person that uh, had the opportunity to serve 28 years at EPA. So unique perspective, both as a career scientist, career employee, and a variety of positions, including the head of the agency. I thought I would begin with social conditions, since uh, I know that there is now happiness economics. Uh, ought to, we ought to talk about social conditions. And, oops, push it too much here. And take a look back with me. EPA created in 1970. What was driving? It was social conditions, social conditions that drove politicians. It was one of the major contributing factors for why EPA was, in fact, created in 1970. Uh, since that time, obviously, as we think about carbon markets, we think about climate change uh, today, uh, although in the polling numbers we've heard about in the last uh, day and a half, perhaps climate change is not the driving concern of people in the United States, whereas it is in other parts of the world, it is on the list, and in fact, it is one of great public debate and interest on doing something. Those who say we need to do something and those that say we don't need to do something but nonetheless, great public debate. Well, as we think about EPA, we often think about the Clean Air Act that Bill just talked about, or some of the other acts, but uh, I submit to you there's actually a plethora of laws, and in fact, this is just a partial list that influence environmental policy. Uh, since this is uh, Rice University Baker Institute, I was going to ask you to take a quiz on how many of these you know the acronyms for, but uh, I won't. Um, but the point is, is that there are many of the laws that EPA either administers, like the Clean Air Act or, in fact, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Water Act, and so forth, but it also is bound by law to make sure that it's following other laws, such as the Endangered Species Act. So EPA has a foundation, both of laws that it has to administer, but also, in fact, it has to make sure that as it makes decisions, it is abiding by those laws. So today, in the brief time I have, I'm going to talk about three challenges. The first one, what issues will the energy sector face as EPA continues to regulate priority air pollutants and address greenhouse gas emissions under the existing Clean Air Act? Second, what role will the Clean Water Act and all of the other clean water pieces of legislation play in climate policy? And then third, a brief comment on what role the EPA enforcement program will play in driving policy outcomes. 
Let's turn our attention to the Clean Air Act. Bill dove into and talked about uh, Section 112 and MAC regulations and what's going to happen following a, uh, uh, a stunning defeat with trying to regulate mercury from coal-fired power plants and now back to the drawing board for the agency. The main point I want to get across is by operation of law, by operation of the existing Clean Air Act, all mobile sources and all stationary sources are required to be regulated by EPA for hazardous air pollutants, for national ambient air quality, the six priority pollutants, as well as now greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't matter whether you're a coal-fired power plant or a school or a lawnmower, by operation of law, you will be regulated. Uh, in fact, the Congressional Research Service, in, a, in a, this year's publication, I believe it was June, noted that for stationary sources, given the existing law, there could be as many as six million permits need to be issued for regulating greenhouse gases alone. And again, not even talking about what Bill talked about. Six million permits. Well, I want to focus my comments on and take complementary to what Bill said. Because for stationary sources, there are basically three big parts of the law that deal with different pollutants. Uh, sections 108 and 109, sections 111, sections 112. And each one poses some unique challenges as you consider the carbon market, and particularly greenhouse gases. Well, the one I'm going to talk about briefly is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, sections 108 and 109 of the Clean Air Act. It requires that the administrator make a decision for six priority air pollutants, such as SOX and NOx and lead and ozone and particulate matter, make decisions that are requisite to protect public health and public welfare with an adequate margin of safety. The first one was set in 1971, and, and I'm sorry, excuse me, 1991, and in fact, required by law every five years for the agency to revisit and make sure that the standard of today, five years later, is adequate to protect public health and welfare with a adequate margin of safety. And that includes all sensitive subpopulations. So what have we seen? Well, the nation, this is the 40th anniversary of the Clean Air Act. And so what we've seen is over the years, in fact, indeed, our air has gotten cleaner because of the EPA regulation and the required uh, pollution control devices. But I would submit to you and certainly propose or pose the question, is sections 108 and 109, are they, in fact, sustainable in the long term? And what do I mean by sustainable? What I mean by sustainable is, is that over time, those health protective numbers have become more and more protective. That's good. Well, let's take lead. When I was making the decision on lead, one of the dilemmas that I faced was the public health community, including, including other parts of the federal government, said there is no safe level of lead. Well, last time you checked the periodic table of elements, lead's on there. So we're not getting rid of it. Now, I must admit, and I, in fairness to the Clean Air Act, it doesn't require that you achieve a zero standard. But what I'm submitting to you for this portion of the law, for the pollutants of SOX and NOx and lead and particulate matter, all of which have great importance to the energy sector, whether you are coal, whether you are gas, or whether you are a number of other sources, a vanishingly small number in a zero standard would be impossible to meet. Well, second, two other deficiencies that I believe in the law. One is, by law, the agency is not allowed 
to consider available technology, nor are they allowed to consider the economic consequences. In other words, you set the standard, it doesn't matter whether there's technology available, it doesn't matter what it's gonna cost you or I or the nation at large. Uh, in fact, to further say how, if you will, unsustainable this is, there are parts of our country that have been in non-attainment for these priority pollutants, and the best projections, they'll be in non-attainment for at least 20 years or more. So on one hand, we have this health protective standard that says it's gonna cause, these pollutants cause premature deaths, cause all of these concerns, and yet, as long as a state is making progress, there are no sanctions. So I submit to you, and I think a serious question is, is it sustainable? Well, I don't believe that section of the law is a good law, a good portion of the law, to try to regulate greenhouse gases. Can't consider economic considerations, available technology, um, again, a serious problems. So let's talk about greenhouse gases. I think we're all aware of the decisions that have been made. I put this up on the screen to really highlight what I believe are the two most critical decisions that have forever changed the debate on controlling greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Forever have changed. The first one is the Supreme Court decision that said that CO2 and other greenhouse gases are pollutants. And second, when the EPA made the decision that these gases cause or contribute, that is the endangerment finding, that triggers literally all aspects of the Clean Air Act. So it's no longer a debate whether there's going to be legislation or no legislation. Uh, as I have said to some of my colleagues, get over it. That debate has now forever changed unless there is legislation. And of course, we know there's been some legislation attempted to try to undo that. But now, we have an endangerment finding, and it's not only for public health, but it's also for public welfare. And so now, it's n we are going to be, our nation will be regulating greenhouse gases. To my colleague from Japan who said, well, I'm kind of concerned about whether cap and trade will, not ha will happen or not happen, the agency will be regulating. It has no choice. I also agree with Bill. It is going to be subject to a lot of litigation. But make no mistake, it has no choice but to issue regulations. Well, this is a hard cartoon to look at or see, but if you can see it, it's uh, two cowboys, how appropriate here in Texas, riding horses, and the horses have diapers on. It's one of my number of uh, favorite political cartoons, and it says, stupid emission control devices. Well, I put that up, yes, as kind of a funny to get your, get your attention a little bit uh, this afternoon. But I really, I, I highlight this because one of the things that EPA lacks is the legal authority, if you will, the legislative authority to exempt sources. So if you are a very small source, a chainsaw, a lawnmower, or a hospital, or a school, or agriculture. Now that's gonna pose a real issue for the agency and for the nation, because as you look at greenhouse gas equivalents, some of the numbers range anywhere from the low percentage to double digit percentage of greenhouse contributions from animal agriculture. So while this is a little tongue in cheek, it does present a real issue once the agency has gone through and dealt with the larger sources. Again, the agency doesn't have the legal ability 
to fend off dealing with smaller sources. And if the, and if the past is prologue to the future, when the, when the Clean Air Act was passed, it was, we're going to focus on the major sources, which it did. And, we res- and today, we're enjoying cleaner air from that. But also, the act is now being used to regulate lawnmowers. So, one of my other cartoons that sort of enjoy, this is a Heathcliff cartoon, and you see the attribution noted. Global warming has been linked to bad breath. Now, I put that up, yeah, as, a, as also just sort of funny poke at, uh, at, the, at the issue, but it also raises a serious issue. Uh, although I don't believe EPA would do this, um, each of us, on average, uh, we each produce about 2.3 pounds, that's one kilogram, of carbon dioxide per day. Some have suggested that the Clean Air Act be used to control population. I trust that that would never happen either at EPA or for our nation. But an interesting notion. Anyway, as I said, EPA lacks the legal certainty to exempt sources, no matter where those sources come from. I said, hopefully never extend, and I don't think it would to extend to our Heathcliff cartoon. But second is, and we talked about it uh, yesterday, and that is, if I can get the screen to go forward. Oops, then it finally does. There we go. This is, shows an energy efficient light bulb on the left hand side, on the right hand side, meanwhile, meanwhile in China. And I don't put this up to, uh, to highlight uh, China or to poke fun at China. Uh, in fact, uh, as, uh, as a colleague said earlier, um, I know that the, the leadership of China is committed to, to a deal with both the energy needs of their nation as well as do it in an environmentally sustainable and address greenhouse gas emissions. But the notion of leakage, leakage of both US business and leakage of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is a fundamental both problem and issue for our country, for Japan, for other developed nations, especially with rapidly developing economies such as China, such as India, such as Brazil, as we talked about yesterday. And one of the problems is the current law doesn't afford a way or an easy way of addressing the notion of leakage. So a real problem. And the third, I think, uh, comment that I will make with regard to limitations of the Clean Air Act is that exactly what uh, has already been mentioned. And that is the other provisions of the law present significant problems. Well, I believe that greenhouse gas legislation is needed and that it needs to balance not only the environmental but the economic as well as social, as well as energy, as well as security issues. The second issue that I wanted to uh, in my remaining time is to, uh, if I can get this to go, you'll just have to look at the slides. The role of the Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act. NGOs are using those parts of the law or those different laws as a way of addressing climate change, whether it's ocean acidification uh, or endangered species or other things like that. Of course, we talked about uh, fracking chemicals, and of course, the agency has called now for what are those chemicals? And here's the dilemma. The dilemma is the Tosca chemicals, very little information is known, let alone the agency know what chemicals are used in terms of the health and safety and environmental profile. 316B, cooling water towers, there is a laundry list of very specific and much needed attention to concerns, whether it's water pollution, availability of drinking water, 
changing aquatic biology from a water perspective. And so there's a lot of activity beyond the Clean Air Act. The last item that I wanted to mention is deals with enforcement. And I just say that because pull up the EPA website and you will see that climate change, climate and clean energy is a priority and the agency will be regulating and will be enforcing. And of course that is going to be a key issue both for the regulated industry but also in international negotiations as to whether not only whether you are trusting and verifying, but are you also enforcing? The US will enforce. My last comment is collaboration is the key. I really believe that greenhouse gas emissions can be controlled. I believe that EPA will and is regulating. I believe that as those regulations go into place, it will drive Congress to coming up with legislation, which in my judgment is the most efficient, and that is cap and trade. And forums such as this, a conference such as this, helps us to both highlight the issues, have an open and frank debate, but also lead toward collaboration. So thank you, Baker Institute, and thank you all. All right, again, my apologies for the technical difficulties we seem to be having. Um, but our last speaker for this panel is uh, Jake Caldwell. Um, uh, he's the Director of uh, Policy and Agriculture, Trade, and Energy at the Center for American Progress. Uh, the Center for American Progress is um, one of the leading think tanks in uh, formation of policy in this country now. And uh, it just so happens that uh, Jake is also one of these um, people who is very, very popular in the blogosphere, from what I'm told. So uh, please welcome Jake. <laughs> I don't Jake. know about that. <laughs> it's too late. It's later than we think. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to actually Administrator Johnson for our service to this country. Thanks to all the sponsors. Uh, I have to say, you should be very proud, if no one has already mentioned this, about the product that comes out of the Baker Institute. I use it all the time. I know it reverberates uh, throughout Washington, D.C. and all over the world. So thank you for all your efforts. I don't have a presentation. I'm actually audio-visually challenged, uh, so I hope that that is okay, uh, given the hour. Um, the Center for American Progress is a progressive think tank in Washington, D.C. It's John Podesta's shop, for those uh, who don't know. Heavy emphasis on communication, but also public policy ideas getting out the door. I have to confess that this is not my day-to-day, -day, Clean Air Act is not my day-to-day -day, uh, bailiwick, although given Bill's uh, <laughs> uh, admonition that the torrent is coming, and it, it, it really is, um, this would be a wise area to, <laughs> unfortunately, probably get into. No, I actually have been spending a lot of time focusing on um, lovely things like the U.S. steelworkers challenging uh, Chinese uh, market practices basically on clean technology and using our trade laws to sort of hit China hard. And I notice I'm in the age demographic at the very bottom of the happiness curve, uh, and I think, I think that fit pretty well for me. Uh, so we can talk about that too later if we want. I thought it would just be very helpful. I'm going to focus mostly on EPA and greenhouse gases. Uh, I do agree on, on a lot of the SOX and NOx uh, issues, but really focus on that and just hit some of the highlights that the administrator and Bill mentioned as well. Um, it isn't pretty. It's true. It's really not uh, a pretty thing. Uh, part of that is because of the actual Clean Air Act and the scaffolding that we've built around it. Part of that is the politics. and. Uh, Part of that is the litigation, and I'll try and touch on all of those things. Just from the center's perspective, we basically, our overall goal is to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. That's what we see fundamentally as the goal ahead. We'd love to put a price on carbon. In terms of the way we do that, either reduce greenhouse gas pollution or put a price on carbon, I'm quite agnostic on how we do it. Uh, it can be legislation. It can be regulation. As the administrator said, it's going to be regulation and legislation. It's going to be everything, right? Uh, but I'm also agnostic on a cap and trade or carbon tax as well. Uh, but the key is to reduce the greenhouse gas pollution and put a price on carbon. 
At CAP, we support, sorry, on my other notes, we support uh, comprehensive clean energy and uh, climate legislation. Notice the present tense. Uh, I hear Bill's prediction. I think that is relatively accurate uh, for the immediate to short term on comprehensive legislation. But there are some interesting parameters going about. But I guess that also goes to the administrator's point in terms of it's not going to be either or. It's not going to be legislation or regulation. Even if Carrie Lieberman had succeeded, the vehicle would have been through the Clean Air Act. And I think what we need to think about is how these things move forward together uh, in the future. And actually also potentially what was left on the table in Carrie Lieberman uh, in terms of some of these more vexing problems uh, with the Clean Air Act. So really parallel tracks, but the problem there is do parallel tracks ever really meet? Hopefully they will. Some quick points on the historical context that the administrator did well on the Clean Air Act, but essentially, uh, you know, Congress has designed the Clean Air Act to respond to science, and as the science develops and evolves, the Clean Air Act is supposed to adjust to that. It's an evolutionary statute. That sounds like an oxymoron. I don't think it is. Uh, we have numerous examples that Administrator Johnson was instrumental in uh, in his career there of the Clean Air Act and basically the Environmental Protection Agency being way, way ahead of Congress on a lot of issues. I'm thinking about lead and gasoline, ozone depleting chemicals. This country led the world on that uh, and showed a path basically that could have some parallels to uh, a global accord on greenhouse gases. It's also obviously, as you guys know, too, uh, quite a, I don't know how to say this, but it operates sort of under a federalism principle. There's a heck of a lot of delegation to the states. Uh, broad goals from the federal thing, but not black helicopters from, the, from uh, Washington. A lot of delegation to the states to implement this in the way that they see fit, as you guys are experiencing here uh, in Texas as well. Uh, as was mentioned, the Clean Air Act regulates sort of three sources, mobile sources, stationary sources, uh, permits for, well, essentially it's mobile sources, and then it's permits for new and modified sources, and then it's existing stationary source regulation. It's the existing sources that are the real uh, crux of the matter, but we're, we're probably a little ways away from that uh, at this point. We talked about Massachusetts versus EPA in terms of greenhouse gases being declared a pollutant, sort of paraphrasing here. The Supreme Court said, we don't know if they're dangerous. But if EPA feels like they find that they're dangerous using science and they can only use science, then uh, they have to regulate under the authority of the Clean Air Act. Uh, I'm brutalizing the opinion, but that's essentially it. Uh, and so the authority was found under the Clean Air Act for EPA to move ahead. And we are in a brave new world now where we are going, we are going to regulate. That has kick-started uh, the way forward. And uh, perhaps it'll make it easier feelings a little bit if we don't think of the brave new world as being so brave and new, but an old world that we're trying to adopt to, uh, adapt to new, new uh, areas. Some of the things that have happened recently, the mobile car on the mobile sources, so Mass versus EPA was brought under the mobile, mobile provisions of the Clean Air Act. One of the quick re, uh, things out of that were the, what we've been called the Clean Car Treaty, which actually is going to have a huge impact on both greenhouse gas emissions and fuel economy saving barrels of oil in this country. Bill mentioned it's 35 miles per gallon, but there's also 5%, as he mentioned, uh, annual decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, $52 billion in costs, so the agency uh, estimates $240 billion in benefits just from the mobile uh, clean car sort of rule that uh, will take effect for model year 16 cars in January, January of this year. We have the endangerment finding. It applies both to mobile and stationary sources, as the administrator said. There's no going back. There was one interesting part that I need his help on in terms of the contribution determination was definitely made, I think, for only mobile sources. And I don't know if we need to make another one for stationary sources, but we can talk about that. That's so insider craziness. But, uh, and then on the stationary sources, we've talked about the two parts, new and modified, existing, I guess my, my points on these in terms of the new and modify, this is the, this is the new source review, this is the, the best available control technology. My point would be that we do need to be careful because we do want to encourage innovation, we do want to encourage change. And so if we aren't transparent with what the heck's going on, uh, we're going to encourage some of those older, dirtier plants to uh, not innovate, and uh, that, won't, that won't do any of us any good. I think EPA, through the, thre the threshold tailing rule, has acted fairly responsibly. Uh, we can debate that uh, fairly practically. 
Uh, I think the 100,000 ton thing reflects, reflects that. And on best available control technology, I hear Bill's uh, warnings and feelings. It's true. We don't know. We don't know at this point uh, what, what they're thinking, the, the rule. Essentially, we've got guidance that is due to the states any day now. It's at the White House, uh, but we don't know what that guidance is. So the states have a legi legitimate gripe, I, I would submit, that uh, they are going to need to start implementing this by January 2011. That doesn't leave a lot of time before this guidance comes out. But the catch, I think, would be on the best available technology. It's probably not going to be things like fuel switching. Uh, it's not going to be, say, uh, you've got to do carbon capture and sequestration. I think it's going to be more things that the industry is, is keen on doing itself, which is sort of energy efficiency measures, get 2 to 4% gains uh, out of some of our older power plants. So we'll see. But I think there's some legitimate issues there on best available control technology. Uh, a lot of people want to move forward with the existing sources. These are the old and really dirty uh, plants uh, through new source performance standards. That, again, is an efficiency type standard. I think that's probably a much, much better idea than the, than the NACs that uh, the administrator was mentioning are just fairly unworkable. But uh, the question, I guess, with the new source performance standards is will they get you far enough in the reductions that you need? What about the politics, just briefly, from D.C.? You know, it's good for me to get out of D.C., but we've all, all of us have brought a lot of D.C. here. Uh, you've heard uh, uh, for sure about Senator Murkowski's uh, proposed effort, that's M-U-R, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, blocking the EPA regulations, or the, the agency's authority to regulate. Uh, that has sort of been superseded by Senator Rockefeller's uh, effort to block for two years uh, the ability of uh, EPA to, to regulate stationary sources. If you were betting on a certain piece of legislation, that's the one to bet on. He has six Democrats on board with him. Uh, but interestingly, Senator Carper and Senator Casey uh, have proposed a counter proposal that would probably put in, into legislation the, the, tailored thre uh, threshold, the threshold tailoring rule, uh, sort of so that we wouldn't be going after the lawnmowers, we wouldn't be going after the horses. Uh, we would be going after only the big, the big guys, the big major emitters. Uh, you've seen certain pressure, obviously, right up until this day on appropriations, EPA's appropriations for, that fund the agency's activities. We've had uh, a letter from 24 major businesses in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've had letters from the environmental community on the other side. Today, it's uh, Senator Inhofe versus veterans uh, who are in support of the agency acting here. Senator Inhofe thinks it's an energy tax of some sort, and the black helicopters are coming. Uh, the public health community has written in today. So you're just going to consistently see this back and forth uh, of sniping at the agency's uh, overview. The White House has promised to veto it, but what if it arrives at the White House desk in terms of an omnibus bill that funds the whole government. Will that be so easy to veto? There's an argument on the other side that that makes it very hard to vote for and put in, put in a rider on EPA and curtailing their activities. Uh, just quickly on other legislation, I agree, I agree with Bill that uh, I think we're headed for Knox and Sox mercury legislation. I haven't focused in, uh, incredibly closely on the MACT issue. It, uh, it, it looks serious, but Senator Carper and Senator Alexander have proposed uh, Sox, Knox, uh, and mercury legislation, uh, what they don't do is the, the last little bit on the, the carbon, the price of carbon. So we'll just have to see how that develops, but I would definitely keep an eye on that uh, in the new year. All the other type of legislation, by the way, will only happen in a lame duck session after the midterm elections. Uh, I think that's about it. There will be the renewable electricity standard that Bill described very, very well, 15% by 2021, but does it do much compared to the state's efforts? Might be natural gas for vehicles, uh, some home energy efficiency things. You obviously here in Texas have an ongoing flexible permit battle with EPA uh, going forward that, uh, that needs to be matched because I or watched because it'll just, uh, you know, obviously you're seeing it in, in, your, in your politics right up to the governor's race uh, and how it's playing forward. On litigation, uh, torrent of litigation is right, but torrent from both sides, uh, you know, all sides are involved. There have been 10 administrative petitions on just the endangerment ruling, uh, 17 petitions for review to the D.C. Circuit uh, from people opposed to the endangerment ruling. 
Uh, we have five petitions for review against the tailoring rule at least. There's a nuisance suit out there saying that we deserve standing because greenhouse gases are in the air. The Justice Department has jumped on the side of the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's definitely time to bring in the Clean Air Act and the, the environmental <laughs> regulation casebook. Uh, so essentially, in conclusion, I think we're going to continue to see this sniping. I think you, from the advocacy community, you're going to see uh, protection of the agency as their main goal. Uh, but from the other side, you're going to see an, uh, an effort to try and curtail its activities. You're going to see from the advocacy community a push to get EPA to make well, to release the darn best available control technology guidance, but also perhaps to make it as strong as possible, you'll have pushback against the other way. I think um, in principle, in general, and we can debate this, I think the agency has acted uh, very responsibly, very respectfully, and with a lot of input and uh, a lot of flexibility. And I hope that that continues going forward. They are constrained by some of the legal statute. All that to say that I think the answer probably at the end of the day is comprehensive clean energy uh, and greenhouse gas legislation. Thank you. Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'd like to open the floor for, for questions or comments, and uh, um, they can be directed specifically at an individual or at the panel as a whole. Here we go. Yeah, so just two little questions. Um, does it matter if the plant is actually in a non-attainment area or not? In no. In terms of any, okay, so it's totally irrelevant. Okay, and then... Uh, for, for CO2. That was quick. Okay. Need more questions from the audience. Uh, in terms of the endangerment finding, uh, did the EPA follow the correct method in, in releasing it? I mean, so what was the method that they used? They did it in, in only a few months. Uh, and, you know, do you see any problems in, in how they went about doing it? Well, I don't, uh, I don't see that there was, a, if you will, a problem in the way they did it, the endangerment finding. Uh, even when I was administrator, we, that was one of, the, one of the, obviously, the driving issues that facing, and that was one of the, among the many, many topics that included in an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, where there was a lot of issues, and that one being one of them. So uh, I know that uh, people are challenging that and will challenge it. Um, but uh, I think that uh, in the end it will it will hold, and then on the since the finding was on mobile sources, uh, when you look at uh, the various Title One and Title Two, the the uh, uh, stationary versus mobile sources, the language of endangerment is identical, or I should say virtually identical. There may be an and or some other article there, but so. As a practical matter, once the endangerment finding was made for mobile sources, uh, it would be, I think, virtually impossible to try to make a case that it wouldn't apply for uh, stationary sources. Just a quick question. Why is there such hostility to using fuel switching as best available control technology? It seems like it's the, the simplest and the cheapest way to achieve the goals of the current administration. Well, I, I, I would say two, two things. One is I think that that's going to be one of the options, particularly for uh, some of the more difficult, uh, I'll say, pollution uh, uh, EGU units that uh, are contributing pollution. But I think, uh, and I agree, I'm not sure which it was, Jake or Bill or both, that in this initial stage of what is going to be the best available control technology will in essence be uh, efficiency opportunities because that's really as a practical matter what is available so uh, I agree with Bill in the short term um, I think it will certainly draw a lot of litigation but as a legal matter the best available control technology and from a technology standpoint are basically going to be for the EG units increasing efficiency so I think some are going to be quite disappointed that you know, they're not going with all these uh, 
various uh, new technologies and for others will still challenge it because it's being regulating, regulated. But, but let me address, it's not just as simple as switching fuels. You, you don't take uh, an 850 megawatt coal-fired power plant and pull the coal pulverizers out and start blowing a bunch of gas into the boiler and everything's fine. The, the, the fuel switching benefit is if you can take a, a Rankin cycle coal-fired power plant, which is maybe 38% efficient on average, roughly, and you're using a high carbon fuel like carbon, and you replace it with a, with a very high efficiency combined cycle natural gas unit. There you're getting, essentially, you're getting a, a almost 50% conversion efficiency plus half the carbon, so you can produce twice the megawatts for the same or less CO2. But that's, you know, that's a multi-billion dollar uh, task. I mean, you know, a new combined cycle is basically a million to a million to a megawatt. So it, it, it's not cheap. Uh, and then th the cost, I mean, right now for combined cycle natural gas, very efficient natural gas electricity versus existing coal, which is not all that efficient, but the newer units are getting much more efficient. In order for the price equivalency to come up, you need a $30 per ton tax on carbon for them to be equivalently competitive. So it's not a cheap, it's not a cheap conversion at all. And just quickly on the, the politics masquerading as legal strategy, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's just indicative of the sort of trench warfare that um, we've entered into both on the endangerment finding and also the, um, uh, whether, you know, what we're gonna see on the best available control technology. What about using uh, carbon offsets as a back? So you could keep the coal it's plant. It's not allowed. Backed is a unit-specific requirement. You can't go off-site to get uh, the reductions needed to comply with backed. That's just a legal reality. Or as a potential solution, not necessarily backed. Sure. If, if it's legislation, I, I'm all for it. I mean, l let's be clear. I think we are unified up here that we need comprehensive carbon legislation to deal with climate change. The Clean Air Act, as is, is, is Joe Barnes pointed out, is at best a third best solution, probably closer to a seventh best solution, in my opinion. Um, we need legislation to deal with the square peg round hole problem of trying to address a non-criteria pollutant that is, you know, there is no source receptor issue here with CO2 uh, to, to a deal with, with this pollutant under the Clean Air Act because it is absolutely inappropriately structured for it. So, and to follow up on that need, desperate need for legislation, because it seems to me you've got a very fragile coalition of the environmentalists you know, who's obviously want to control emissions. And then you've got on the right, the energy security people who think we need to do something. And you've got the Tom Friedman groupies, you know, who see entrepreneurship. But now as we've learned here that, you know, if you improve greenhouse gas emissions, that actually hurts security. Or if you improve security at the cost of in better energy supplies to the US at the expense of, uh, you know, worse than greenhouse gas emissions. And as I say, Tom Freeman's approach, well, that isn't necessarily so that be the first to manufacture is really an advantage. It seems to me once in Washington they learned the truth from the Baker Institute, this whole thing's just going to blow up. You're going to have no coalition at all. <laughs> and Sorry, it's kind of ending on a down note here, but uh, I, I'm very discouraged, actually. As I mentioned, I, I represent probably, I, I don't know, I represent a lot of electric generating companies. And some of the, you know, if you look at the, some of the leading large electric companies in the country, Jim Rogers at Duke, uh, Wayne Leonard at Entergy, uh, David Crane at NRG, these guys, you know, and who are the other, in FPL, the participants in US CAP, these guys want comprehensive climate legislation. They just want to know the rules of the road to address the problem. Because right now, they don't know the rules. And they're not going to get, they're not going to learn the rules of the road through EPA regulation. That just can't happen. And that's, and that's the other thing, just it's a semi unrelated point, but I was looking at some stuff from Bloomberg New Energy Finance the other day, and the investment in the clean energy sector is up 72% in this, you know, in the conditions that we're in right now in this country. Uh, so a lot of it is some of the stimulus, but uh, uh, it's, that's fairly impressive uh, investment. So some people are betting on this particular approach. 
I don't know if it would be the Tom Friedman approach, but it, it, there's certainly a, there are drivers for innovation, driver for competitiveness in this country, and I'm not so sure the steel workers trying to hit with a trade dispute, you know, is one way to to enhance the competitiveness of this country. I was just curious if I understand this correctly. Um, you know, with the with the statement that. Uh, the EPA um, regulations is the third or seventh best methodology to tackle greenhouse gas. If I understand the administrator's presentation correctly, with the Supreme Court ruling, you have no choice at this point. Even if we did have cap and trade or a carbon tax, the EPA is still required by law to pursue some type of, of regulation based on this ruling. Do I, do I understand that correctly? That's correct. Um, it's, it's clear by Supreme Court ruling and an endangerment finding that greenhouse gas emissions will be regulated. Now, is that the best approach? Again, in, uh, in, in our opinion, from different perspectives, um, it is, uh, can it be done? Yes. Is it the best, most efficient? Uh, is it able to balance issues? Is the clean air, current Clean Air Act able to balance economic energy security, uh, issues such as uh, uh, the international component. Uh, it is not. It is not. But notwithstanding, the EPA has no choice given the existing law, so it will be regulating. Well, but keep in mind that, that the, the, the Kerry Boxer bill that was introduced would have taken the authority of EPA to regulate under subchapters C and D of the Act away from EPA. So the new source review, NSPS, and NACS authorities would have been removed from EPA. In lieu of that would have had the cap and trade program. And not only that, there were a lot of goodies to address leakage, uh, a whole bunch of things for every, everybody on the Christmas tree uh, as a way forward. So it, one way to look at the legislation is it would give a hug again to EPA, but to redefine the role of what EPA would be regulating under. Is that fair? Yes, uh, and I, I guess I would, uh, I'd say Tom Carper would love to hear me say this, and, um, but I believe that, uh, if you will, a four pollutant bill that would deal with SOX, NOx, mercury, and greenhouse gases is probably the best because I think in spite of the e EPA, the agency's best effort when I was there or now under, under a new administration, uh, it's still fraught with significant legal difficulties. Um, and Bill mentioned a lot with Mac. So, so I have a question. I mean, given how you've described these EPA regulations and how they work, uh, I have some questions about how that affects trade. So I'll use the example of oil sands. Uh, because I think that's a really great example. We have a very close relationship with Canada. They're part of NAFTA. Um, these oil sands are a major thing coming into the United States. Uh, does this give the EPA jurisdiction over what Canada can and can't produce and export to the United States? And, and, and how do issues like that come up? And, you know, would that affect the state of Wyoming if they want to produce oil sands in Wyoming? I'm just trying to think about the way you've described it how broad the implications could be? Uh, that's a great question. And, and in as of even, right... In light even of WTO, because, you know, we have these other commitments to WTO and NAFTA. Right. <laughs> uh, it's less a NAFTA issue right now than it is a NEPA issue. And, indeed, some of the environmental community have petitioned EPA uh, and the government, uh, actually the Transportation Department, to stop the uh, construction of a pipeline from Western Alberta that was going to produce the, the bottomless oil from the sands and import it into Pad 3 down in the Chicago area because it is a very carbon intensive production process and that in order for them to approve the pipeline crossing the border, they have to do a full greenhouse gas analysis source to reception. And is of right now, Nancy Sutley seems to indicate that, yeah, that's what you've got to do. And, and my own view of, of, uh, of NEPA says, no, you, you can't. You're, you're going beyond the scope of NEPA's authority to go to transboundary analysis for approving your standard 
type of NEPA approval. And I think it's going to have some pretty profound impacts. Now, they're, they're really struggling with this now for the very reason you said, which is all of a sudden we're getting into trade problems and there may be some backing off, but I think it does have some really significant impacts on, on trade. And just to mention trade, as I think many people in this room are well aware that there are some significant non-tariff trade barriers in place right now for U.S. technologies uh, in moving, moving off seas, which are uh, off the United States, which are in fact, if uh, would move us and would advance globally uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. Yeah, we had the the interesting discussion about lithium, uh, which we may all need, wasn't lithium for depression too, like, you know, I don't know, uh, <laughs> afterwards, but um, not so much that presentation, maybe ours. Uh, uh, China is part of, I'm sorry to dwell on this, but we, there is actually a WTO dispute that we're in cahoots with the European Union and Mexico on, uh, in China basically having an export ban on rare earth elements that are used in a lot of clean energy technology. Um, that's, that's a big problem and that needs to be struck down. Uh, but um, the bigger objection of the Canadians on the oil sands, well, the pipeline is a big concern for sure, uh, but also under the other Energy Act in 2005, was that? Um, we had some procurement guidelines basically that said that we needed to lower the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of the fuel we were buying and uh, the Pentagon is a pretty big purchaser of Canadian oil sands uh, fuel, so, you know, basically when it all shakes down. Uh, and so they were apoplectic and um, uh, we've, I think we've succeeded in calming them down. I don't know if they've earned an exception. They, they do have a general exception under a government procurement agreement between Canada is within the government procurement agreement and also the NAFTA will help them as well. But those are the kind of issues that... Yeah, and there are some national security right. exemptions that uh, could, I, I think, could be invoked. I think that the tar sands, I mean, I'm not an expert on the tar sands, but I think they probably have bigger economic problems. Yeah, but, but I would point out, you know, one of the ironies of, of the U.S. sitting in judgment of Canada is that Canada has actually ratified the Kyoto Protocol and is trying to comply with it while we sit around and go <laughs> So us, us deciding that we ought to be uh, barring them shipping energy into the U.S. is a little bit ironic. Yeah, but that that's, yeah, I wouldn't give, they're no angels, though, and they're way, abo they're way above their Kyoto targets, and they're, they're definitely hiding behind the skirt of uh, the United States and claiming they're not going to do any action until we, until we take action. Hi. Um, maybe a slightly different subject here. Um, in light of, I don't want to discount what happened in East Anglia, but in light of some of the difficulties the IPCC had with the East Anglia data fiasco of 2009 and some of the repair work they're trying to do in terms of um, tightening up their scientific method and their peer reviewing of scientific method, et cetera. Bringing that back to the EPA, I think we all like to agree or, or hope anyway that there's some scientific background to some of the decisions that are made, some of the legislation undertaken, some of the regulations put in place. Have the EPA in any way, shape, or form, are they trying to take any lessons from what the IPCC are doing now in terms of tightening up the peer review process, making certain that the underlying science is in fact well, it's a, truly it's, science? Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue that every administrator of EPA has faced and, and, and every administrator that I know of, myself included, including current administrator, take additional steps to try to strengthen the science through peer review and through notice and comment. Um, through uh, public fora, whether it's uh, uh, public meetings and others, to try to do everything you can to uh, in peer review. Um, but you know, having said that, um, I would urge you to look at uh, the language that talks about causing or contributing uh, and to to potential effects. It doesn't have to be real effects. It can be a contribution, uh, and uh, some argue that the threshold, the, the legislative threshold for a pollutant, once the Supreme Court made a decision that it is a pollutant, that the, that the 
scientific threshold is pretty low. Um, again, I think the agency works hard at trying to present the best science. Uh, clearly, there's uh, there's a, a lot of evidence of uh, of concern. Uh, and again, I think that the endangerment finding will withstand whatever legal pressure there is, given what the legislative language is uh, for pollutants. Uh, I should say, since Josh mentioned the uh, onion a few years ago, uh, it was a fast approaching Valentine's Day and the onion published a front page article saying that I was banning Valentine's Day. And the, the reason why I was banning Valentine's Day, it had become apparent to me as administrator that love was in the air and that love was creating people, causing people to do crazy things and have different feelings in their stomach. And that I had determined that it was a pollutant under the law, therefore I was banning Valentine's Day. That, that article made it all over the blogosphere emails <laughs> in a day when that came out. That was... I didn't, by the way. Yeah, hopefully it won't make it to the Supreme Court. Um, and then on the science, I think it's just going to, uh, we are relitigating a lot of the science, but I think it's going to call for greater scrutiny uh, going forward of um, what we see. But, I mean, the previous administration also produced uh, an interagency document on the science that um, was pretty, pretty clear. Yeah, the, the East Anglia PR fiasco, and that really is what it is more than anything else, uh, there have been subsequent reviews on what was really underlying the, the emails, and no one has really, uh, on a serious way, chastised the underlying science. They were just, I think, trying to shape its, its acceptance. Uh, nonetheless, it was in very poor judgment, and... I think has done a fair amount of harm to the public perception on the IPCC's conclusions, regrettably, in my opinion. Uh, I would, I, I'd like to go back to one thing because they have talked about the Carper legislation. I, I'm a big fan of Tom Carper's and I like his legislation, but one of the uh, shortcomings, that, as you recall, the central focus of my presentation is this MAC rulemaking. And while the Carper bill nominally says we're going to address SO2, NOx, and mercury. The problem is, is it also then leaves in place exactly what's in the rule today, which means they're still going to regulate the acid gases, which means they're still going to force all of these plants to put on scrubbers in five years. So it doesn't really solve the problem that I identified as a potential catastrophe in the making. That's something that I'm hoping that Carper and his staff will actually seriously look at and, and deal with, because the reality is, the whole purpose behind regulating the power industry under the statute, uh, under HAPS, was mercury. There was, a, there was a requirement in the act. They were originally, power plants were not included under 112, but there was a study that was required of EPA to look at whether uh, it should be regulated, the power industry should be regulated under 112, and the entire purpose of that and the focus of the study was mercury. Uh, and the answer is, we should be controlling mercury. There is no question about it. There's n virtually no one in the industry even disputes it. But it's the ancillary 187 additional pollutants that are going to jump up and bite them. But, you know, the reality is hydrogen chloride and hydrogen fluoride from a smokestack uh, 750 feet up in the air poses a threat to absolutely no one and no thing. But we're going to put a scrubber on for it. Yeah, and let me be clear. When I said uh, Tom Carper would uh, appreciate my saying, uh, supporting what I what I what I meant by that is a four pollutant approach. I mean, it makes no sense to me to have all the issues. I mean, we're dealing with the same electric generating units. So whether it's SOx, NOx, mercury, or greenhouse gases, we're dealing with the same same arena, same sector. So we ought to have uh, a have legislation that addresses that sector and perhaps other sectors for uh, those that four groups of pollutants. I think we've worn them out. I think so. My question is with uh, the MACT coming at the power plants and the potential impact to the coal industry with the abundance of coal we have in this country. Um, 
what options does Cole have? And I guess I'm keen on, does this bring gasification into play now? Yeah, look, let's be clear. The macro making is not going to shut down the industry. I, I think at least 70% of the units, probably 80% of the capacity, will put on the controls and they're going to keep operating. And, and this whole idea, so the coal is going to continue to be used. And the, the, the new source review, it, I think, likely is going to end up being counterproductive. And, and Jake noted the potential for that, which is once you've put a billion dollars of controls on a billion dollar plant, you're going to make real sure <laughs> that you don't do something that triggers a backed requirement that makes you spend another billion dollars to put the CO2 in the ground or do something else ridiculous or change it to gas. That's just, you know, so the, the industry is going to be meticulous in assuring that they don't trigger BACT and those plants will be around for 40 or 45 years. So until and unless we get a price on carbon or a trading regime where they can make economically rational decisions, coal is going to be here for a long time. And then, you know, the general, the general prescription today is at somewhere between $60 and $80 a ton, uh, carbon capture and storage becomes economical, even for the existing uh, rank and cycle coal plants, not the, not the IGCC. Uh, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic closing session. You all are a fantastic audience, really just truly an engaged uh, audience. Uh, and I want to commend many of you uh, because you are not only a fantastic audience today, you have been engaged coming here for three years talking to us about this work. And so, uh, and then calling us and emailing us and we're coming out to talk to you. So we really appreciated all the input we've gotten from the Energy Forum and uh, uh, just letting you know how much that means, uh, the membership uh, for the companies and the support from the companies um, in doing this. It would not have been possible. Just many, many, many contributions from the thinking about cost curves to um, Ken's wonderful chart of the difference between what the DOE says wind costs and what wind actually does cost, or nuclear costs, and actually having an electricity company give us their cost for actual new build. Um, all these things make a really big difference uh, in our ability to understand the issues, um, and also our ability to think about, you know, what are the best scenarios? There's only so many scenarios you can do at one time. Uh, one of the great things about having a conference like this a lot of people have raised very interesting questions. We're going to continue to do this work. Uh, 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 to thank them, uh, for example, ConocoPhillips has agreed to continue to fund ongoing work in this area. So uh, our thanks to them, and uh, we will continue to work with their support and support of other organizations. Uh, uh, our fingers are crossed, including the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, so uh, we are going to be continuing this work. We, we appreciate your continued involvement. And uh, it's really been a pleasure these two days. Uh, I'm impressed with what readers you are. I thought, you know, probably about 50% of people will take the printed copy of the paper, the different papers. And so therefore, we ran out of them. And so my apologies to everyone. Uh, if, you, if you really hate electronics, uh, of course, the papers are all posted online. But if you like the printed copy, because I am a printed copy human being, uh, you know, please email Jane. And uh, you can find her on the way out and give her your card or tell a colleague to give her your card. And we will print up a set of papers and pop them in the mail to you. And... Uh, uh, we hope to see you soon, uh, just to give you uh, the range of things we're working on besides continuing to work on this study. Uh, we have a major project uh, coming up uh, looking at U.S.-Mexico relations uh, through the prism of oil reform in Mexico and what that's going to mean for the Mexican economy, what's that going to mean for the oil market, um, what that's going to mean for U.S.-Mexico border and general relations. Uh, so we will be having another conference like this. Uh, first one will be in Mexico City. Uh, we are also working 
uh, with Kuwait Petroleum, who is one of our Energy Forum members, uh, to have a major conference looking at uh, shale gas and its implications for Asia. Uh, and hopefully we'll be also working on that subject with the uh, uh, Institute for International uh, Energy Economics of Japan. So we have a lot of great uh, continued work uh, to do, and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Uh, we thank you for your diehard participation um, and all our speakers for being so uh, fascinating that we held the audience here for two straight days at a higher level. We're sorry we ran out of seats at lunch. It's because we didn't think you guys had that stamina. Uh, so uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. And if you've had any other questions about the study or you want to talk to an individual researcher, just pop us an email and we'll put you in touch. Thank you very much.